Our speaker for this morning's message is a father of two handsome, effervescent boys. A husband of the most beautiful wife. And the head of business sales at a well-established telecommunications company. He is also the facilitator of the Wednesday night classes, Continuing Conversations That Matter, held right here at Temple. He's a very vibrant, humorous, witty, determined, sometimes aggressive, but also caring and loving. He's a perfect example of a father. Please help me to welcome your speaker, Mr. Norman Anthony Nair. Thank you, Kiman. <laughs> and good morning <clears throat> to your friends and special and family. A special welcome to all the fathers and those who play the role of fathers in the life of so many children. I use this opportunity to wish you a happy Father's Day and for you to continue the stellar work that you're doing. Good morning also to our listeners on the World Wide Web as they join us in celebration of our fathers. So as we do so, I'm quickly reminded of an incident some time ago when I was walking on the mall with Kimon, and two ladies were passing us and looked up just in time and heard one of them remark, eh him look like him father, but him handsome. <laughs> What's with that? <laughs> I'm not sure what that means. <laughs> Jordan now, uh, who you saw earlier, Jordan, can stand. Jordan. Yeah. Yeah is my other son. He too has been often told how good looking he is. <laughs> I assure you one of them is a uh, jacket. <laughs> <laughs> I know you're saying thank God for them mother. <laughs> uh, nothing is wrong with that but today we are celebrating Father's Day. So. Before I get started, I want to invite three persons to come to share the stage, share their different aspects of fatherhood. Each person just come on stage immediately after, um, one after the other, as I call your name. Uh, first up, we'll have Mr. Norman Wright speaking as a grandfather, and then Professor Howard Spencer speaking as a stepfather, and then Dr. Tamu Davidson speaking on lessons learned from her father. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming uh, Mr. Norman Wright. Morning, all. Morning. Thank you, Norman. You see, the Normans are all over the place. Oh, it is my pleasure to share with you. And you know, lawyers are supposed to follow their instructions very strictly. So I was told three minutes. So to assist me in that short period, it is said that one picture is worth a thousand words. So I brought three pictures. So that would be 3,000 words, which you will get. So while I am sharing with you, I'm going to ask two visitors to just come forward. Oh, my wife now says she will take one. So my wife and two visitors to just show you the different stages of my beautiful, loving, beloved granddaughter, Naya. She's Naya Wright. Um, so you can just show in the mirror. Um, as Reverend John will tell you and a number of others, um, my step, my daughter-in-law and son got married here, got married here about three years ago. And um, they, were, my, they were on their way to Qatar where my son flies as a, a pilot. Um, and they have been there ever since. About 18 months after they um, got married, we got the good news that she was pregnant. And we were, of course, delighted. Um, 
a couple of months later, we got news which made us wonder what was happening. And it was that the doctors in Qatar were of the view that the nature of the pregnancy was such that the best place for her to be was in the United States. She went to the United States and spent five months on her back, after which she delivered a perfect child. And the, the concerns which I had, fortunately the teachings here, helped me to deal with it, is that, and, and based on my experience, the reason they required that special attention because she was no ordinary child. Uh, God was putting a little more, and she had to spend five months. Her mother, the, the, the um, mother, the grandmother, was good enough to take up residence in the hospital where everything had to be done. She could move around, she had to be fed and looked after. But fortunately, and thank God, she's a beautiful, loving child, and um, I don't know how many of you had a chance, had a glimpse of the pictures, but it shows different stages. And she grows from strength to strength, and we are happy with her. And I'll just show you, in spite of her having been only about like nine or 10 months, just one example, they were spending time at our home. And um, her mother was entertaining some friends in the dining room. And Jean and I had Naya, try to keep her out of the way and enjoying her presence and all that. But Naya was determined that she wanted to go and join her mother. And as soon as we took her eyes off her, and she was about nine, she could just barely walk, she got up out of the, 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 the seat in which we were sitting, climbed over a hassock, went to the doorway from the den where we were, and when she reached the door, although she couldn't talk, she turned around and did this. <laughs> she was telling us we should come with her so that we can all be where her mother was. She has been a joy and a beauty. And if you don't believe me, try it sometime. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Before I start, I wish to acknowledge the presence of Mrs. Ma Maxine Brown, who has been like a sister to Beverly. And many of you, she has attended the Temple of Light. Notice she didn't stand earlier because she has been a member of Temple of Light also. Happy Father's Day to all fathers, grandfathers, stepfathers, friends who have played a role as fathers and of course, fathers in waiting. <laughs> I'm grateful to be given this opportunity to talk to you on this Father's Day about my experiences of fatherhood. Before I do so, I wish to acknowledge the support I've received over the years from the teachings of Temple of Light, which was introduced to me by our esteemed founding minister, Reverend Elmer Lumsden. The teachings have strengthened my understanding that everything flows from God, our infinite source, but we are responsible for developing our potential and we live by the choices we make. Fatherhood is defined as the protective, supportive, and responsible role played by individuals towards their children. There are three attributes which I've found helpful over the years as a father and a father. They are commitment, being a role model, and unconditional love. Commitment, the commitment of caring for your children and ensuring that they get all the love, material and psychological support they require to succeed must be foremost in the father's consideration and actions you are in the situation and role for the long haul. This does not mean endorsing everything they do, but they must never feel they are rejected. They should know that dad can be relied on for support and he can be called anytime, even from the other side of the world. 
To be there for the small, large, or non-occasion may mean sacrificing things you wish to do or doing things you never expected to do. I recall how I finally learned to swim. My girls had learned to swim from they were quite small. And each time we went to a facility with a pool or to the beach, I would have to watch while they swam up a storm. I therefore decided, along with a colleague who also could not swim, that we had to take our lessons. This we did. And although I had some fears starting so late, it was important to be able to establish that I would be there to protect them. And I would participate in something they enjoyed despite my busy work schedule. Role model. As a father, I recognize that children need to know and understand the principles by which we live. Also, the boundaries of acceptable behavior which they can engage in. Children live what they learn, so the right role model is important. For example, it is said that the father must be a role model for his sons by how he lives, how he treats his wife, daughters, and other women. He must demonstrate that the right values and behavior that he would like to be adopted by his children. I hope that our sons and daughters will be good role models for their children. Unconditional love. This is defined as love that makes no demands, sets no limits, expectations, or requirements. There have been occasions when our adult children have made choices which disappointed us. However, our love for them has never diminished. The parable of the prodigal son best illustrates the unconditional love that the father has for his son who was welcomed home despite his action. In closing, I leave this quote to which I have made an addition. It reflects my role as a father over the years. Blessed is the man who hears gentle voices call him father, dad, daddy kins, uncle Spee, uncle Howard, prof. These gentle voices are those of my children, stepchildren, nephews, students, and young adults who, have, who I have mentored over the years. Best wishes to all and enjoy this special day. Good morning, everyone. I was asked, I was given a similar instruction to keep it to three minutes, so I keep it as tight as possible. So I'm going to talk about my father, the lessons I've learned. You may know him as Professor Winston Davidson. You may know him as Winty in his politics day, and even know. Or you may know him from the one and only boys' school in Jamaica, Fortis. <laughs> so I know that if I was a boy, I would not have any choice, but I would have gone to Fortis. So the next best thing is I went to the best girls' school in the island, St. Andrew High School, Andrews. <laughs> so I'm going to just share with you, I was told to share three, and I think I found four things, um, lessons my father taught me. One is do the right thing. That's the first one. Do the right thing. So my, I'll go to my father and say, hey, you know, I'm having this challenge. He says, do the right thing. You know what to do. So that's the first one. The second one is family. Sorry. is important. <laughs> the third thing is respect and value people for who they are. <laughs> and <laughs> I'm sorry. Maybe it's been up all night, I really for life. And also having such a wonderful father. <laughs> 
um, respect people for who they are. So I would always see my father, it doesn't matter, it could be prime minister, king, queen, he gives his own opinion, and you had to better give back the respect he gave you. So that's the other thing. So if it's a man sweeping on the street, you should respect him. And then the final thing is that you are born into this world, the sky is the limit. So Professor Davidson is the singer, um, the doctor, the politician, the counselor, um, and also, you know, he has a talent. He has the Davidson plot, so he can actually plot. When we were <laughs> 10 years old, he used to plot right here. So <laughs> I give us the Davidson plot. So the sky's the limit, and there's nothing that you cannot do. And I, he didn't really say that, he didn't articulate that, but I didn't see him, any challenge that came, he just took it on. And so I think those were um, one of the greatest lessons. And I think one of the um, fondest memories was my father dropping me off at a fet at St. Andrew High. And you know, as a teenager, you really don't want your parents around. And he was there looking through the gate, watching to make sure I got in OK. So I would say my father has been a very loving father. He's been there for us. He may not have articulated these lessons in words, but he did them. Um, and we can see them demonstrated in his life. Thank you very much. That's so wonderful, the sharing, isn't it? Please give them another round of applause. Okay, so some years ago there was a, a video that was spreading on YouTube for an award-winning TV commercial from the Belgium. It's about a condom called Zazu. It shows a father with his son at a store, supermarket. After a while, the kid wants some sweets. But after I know, the dad gets a pretty embarrassing show. Screaming and shouting and shoving everything off the shelves. His son was having a fit and just really throwing a tantrum. The people in the supermarket are staring at the situation, which makes the father feel embarrassed and sorry. With a demonstrated experience like this, the obvious conclusion for the condom brand was to say, Use a condom. <laughs> I can openly say it, that I'm glad this message was lost on me. <laughs> of course, for more reasons than one. And I'm sure I'm not the only father or mother, for that matter, in this audience who feels this way, no pun intended. To this, I want to add my own words to the joy of fatherhood that leads me into my title talk. We can't want it bad enough for others to get it. I watch the Oprah Winfrey shows ever so often, and especially in the early days, early days there was always someone crying in their expression of joy as we witnessed just now. And I thought all this was so staged and question the authenticity of those experiences. Except I found myself in a similar situation when Kim and I took Kim on to St. Andrew Prep. First day at school, and as we departed, leaving our child at school, tears flow. No, <laughs> no my cheeks, uncontrollable. <laughs> Uncontrollably. <laughs> As I swell with pride and turned to Kim and said, We have done well. That's all I could have said. This is not staged. <laughs> I, 
I just, for that moment, went back there. Um, it happened again, this time with Jordan, on the day of GSAT results, when I rushed to the school to share the experience of the exercise. There was some pressure leading up to the exams, and even doubt crept in from his teachers, but I knew what he was capable of. And so he shared the results, and I looked at them. It was a sweet victory for us. I beam with pride, and again, the tears roll uncontrollably. Like all parents, I'm sure we share a special bond with our sons in a way society tends to define some of we, let me say that again. Like all parents, I'm sure, we share a special bond with our sons. And in a way, society tends to define some of how our do's and don'ts as we go about doing this. I've not fallen victim to some of these norms and as a result, I hug and kiss my boys all the time. In the morning when they wake up, when I drop them off at school, not so much Kim on this, at this time, <laughs> but yes, still Jordan. And in the evenings or nights when I get home and they come to greet me at the car, giving me a king's welcome, and of course, just before they go to bed, none of this is stage or curse. It's just a ritual we continue to practice from they were young. While at home, I'll call them, or in passing, just to stop and hug and kiss them on the cheek, whispering affirmations all the time, especially the children blessing on the church program. We love you. We appreciate you. We salute the Christ in you. We see your shining light onto your world. God is blessing you now, and so it is. Sometimes I just tell them how wonderful they are and how happy I am to be their dads, their dad. Our friends, and indeed some of you, have offered up kind comments to Kim and I about our kids, and for this I thank you. I'm sure these words, and certainly the approach we have taken on parenting, have made a positive difference to their lives. That said, in my household, we have not spared a rod. With these kids, although less so these days as they're getting older, but we love them no less. As fathers, indeed as parents or guardian, we always want the best for our kids, and so we'll go through great lengths to present them with the opportunity to be, do, or have anything they desire. These days, we say to them, you guys have it so good. We have them doing chess, tennis, drumming, swimming, ballet, and all the kinds of lessons as we expose them to all the possibilities we never had as parents. Kimon commented to me one evening when I was taking him from school. So daddy, when your mommy used to pick you up from swimming? <laughs> to which I said, stop there. <laughs> As I burst out in laughter, pick up, swimming, are two words not in my parents' vocabulary. So these kids have it good. As parents, we are the channel through which our children come onto this plane. This leaves us with the inherent belief that we are the only channel through which their good comes to them. As parents, this is why we worry so much about our ability to provide for our kids. We tend to play the role of God in the sky, or Santa Claus, if you will. And even as part of this teaching, we want to ensure that we are the channel through which this ask and it is given is fulfilled. But should this be? In one of our talks on parenting in Vortex, Esther Hicks of Law of Attraction fame and the author of the book, Ask and It Is Given, she's quoted as saying, quote, when your child wants things that you can't possibly give, 
Don't worry, because you're not the only source through which desires can flow. Focus on the perfection of your child's desire, but remove your responsibility from being the avenue through which it would flow. Encourage them to speak of what they want and teach them to harmonize with that, they want, with that which they want. Watch together with your child through which avenue these things will flow. The child will then feel a very satisfying independence while discovering that the universe responds in many different ways in order to manifest a dream. She goes on providing guidance on being the best parent you can, where she said, the best parent you can be means understanding their desire will bring them whatever they want and that their alignment is necessary and that you are not responsible for their alignment, end quote. I understand this to mean that children, or anyone for that matter, must align themselves with the good they desire. So as parents, you can't want it enough for your kids to have it, it being whatever they want to be, do, or have. I've said to my kids, you must demonstrate commitment to improving your time doing swimming by going to training in the mornings as requested by the coach. As part of that commitment, you have to wake up early, have your things ready, and only then you can ask me to drop you off at the pool at 5.30 a.m. I have frustrated myself trying to do all this to them until I put a stop to it, deciding that they are the ones who need to be diligent about all this. To date, they have not demonstrated the commitment or the alignment with that which they have expressed a desire. Other parents, and indeed the coach, has suggested that as their father, I should take them up and get them to the pool and do all the preparation to have them go to the training in the mornings. I assure them I cannot, sorry, I assure them I cannot want it enough for my kids to get it. In contrast, I've seen them wake up early and done all the preparation when we are going down to the hotel for vacation. <laughs> so I know it's possible. When my kids were preparing for GSAT, I told them, whichever school you pass for, there you will go. All right? I will not make any attempts at a transfer. As you would say, you make your bed, you must lie in it. This was clearly a motivator, as not only did they both did well, they ended up at the schools of their desire. Campion and Jamaica College. Yes. At some level, I know they understood the message and then apply themselves. This is the alignment to which I speak. They must want it bad enough for themselves and thereafter I lend my support. I'm sure this is what is meant in regards to biblical reference that the Lord help those who help themselves. Helping yourselves meaning get into alignment with your desire or that state of being as if it is already happening. This requires a commitment and diligence to practice that which will get you to your desire. Be it a spiritual practice like prayer, meditation, affirmation, or physical practice like I'm sure Usain Bolt does. But how does this apply to you, not just as parents, but as we seek to lend support to individuals in whatever way we are again remind in, in whatever way? We are again reminded we are not the only channel through which good comes into somebody else's life. Quoting again from Esther Hick, she said, you cannot get sick enough to help sick people get better. You cannot get poor enough to help poor people thrive. 
It is only in your thriving that you have anything to offer anyone. If you're wanting to be of an advantage to others, be as tapped in, tune in, and turn on as you possibly can. End quote. I'll read it again. You cannot get sick enough to help sick people get better. You cannot get poor enough to help poor people thrive. It is in your thriving that you have anything to offer anyone. If you're wanting to be of advantage to others, be as tapped in, tune in, turn on as you possibly can. It means I can empathize all I want with your situation to the point where I'm feeling your pain. But then I would not have addressed your concern as I seek to help you out. You literally have to be tuned in to your desire, much in the same way as you tune in to Zip 103 uh, to get, uh, much as you tune in to 103 FM to get Zip radio station, or you dial a number for a friend. You cannot tune in to any other frequency to get Zip or dial a different number and get that specific friend. This is how one gets tuned in to their own desire, and it will happen when it's ready. And I'm afraid there's not much we can do about this except continue in our own demonstration that ultimately will create a belief in the mind of another. That's where the change has to take place, in the mind of the other who is in need or have a desire. The Bible is quoted as saying, be he transformed by renewing of the mind. This then is where all change is taking place in consciousness. But what can I do to help someone you ask? Just know, firstly, that divine intelligence is expressing through each and every one of us. Say that again. The divine intelligence is expressing through each and every one of us. You can be a demonstrator of your own alignment. That's the best you can be about those who you want to lend your support. You must be a demonstrator, a consistent, constant demonstrator of being in your own alignment. In relation to your role as parents in lending support to our children, the following is suggested, is a suggested list of things that we can do from an anonymous writer. One, don't tell them what to do. Talk to them. Give them an opportunity to co-create with you on, and own the idea. Two, don't freak out when they go through hard times. This is their contrast that presents an opportunity to exercise choice or preference, something you should not deny them. We tend to want to have everything smooth, and you know, life offers you contrast, and how you handle them and respond to them is what will make a difference in your life. Three, give advice. Tell them to trust how they feel. Four, get them to understand their life is in their hands and that they will attract according to their mood and attitude. Five, tell them that you are here to help, but you have a life of your own and they are responsible for theirs. So be it a parent or otherwise, I'll also add, where it is of no burden, lending a helping hand, as in doing so, please lend a helping hand, as in doing so, we'll be practicing compassion and recognizing the oneness of all. So as you go out for the week ahead, just remember, we can't want it bad enough for others to get it. Namaste.